Blog post 41. Date, July 23rd. Followers, 33,996. The moment the stake left the barrel, I realised my error. In all the practice I'd done out in the woods the previous day, I'd been aiming at a stationary target. But this one was moving towards me fast and was able to see with vampire awareness exactly what I was doing. Christopher was already metres away from where I'd aimed and, rather than hitting him square between the eyes as I'd planned, the projectile merely shattered the glass display cabinet full of medieval swords and spikes. Anger surged inside this monster I'd tried to destroy as I frantically reloaded the gun. The air temperature was dropping, as if he was able to suck the very life and heat from the room. You will regret that, he said. I knew I would. I just didn't know how much. God, what happened next? Sorry, it's not easy to write this. If only I'd been thinking straight, I would have been able to save him. I'm sure of it. Had I not been so distracted by the chill in the air and the shattering of the glass, I might have realised what was coming. But the truth was... I had assumed Christopher was still after me. I was the one who'd fired the gun. I was the one who turned him. I was the one who deserved his wrath. But he wasn't. With a screech that resonated through my very bones, he spun around and leapt across to where my parents and Glenn were huddled. It was such a sudden movement, so fast... I couldn't make sense of what was happening until it was too late. Christopher's hands were on either side of my father's head and he gave one quick twist. That was all it took and my dad fell to the floor, dead. No! Our voices rang out in unison. Glenn and Mum dropped to the floor beside my dad's body, their wailing instant. And me? For a second I just stood there, not believing what I'd just seen. It couldn't be true. It couldn't. Not Dad. I still struggled to accept it. How my life could be so utterly destroyed in such a brief moment. I wake up some days and it's a minute before it hits me again. Other days feel like twisted nightmares. I'll go downstairs, thinking that Dad'll be there in the kitchen getting himself a cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit. But he never is. Because he's gone. He's really gone. Christopher turned and locked eyes with me, smiling. It felt as if I were looking into the soul of the devil himself. They taste better when the pulse is still going, you know. But I'm sure we could still get a decent meal out of him, if you'd like. He was taunting me, saying things that would make me act irrationally, and it worked. My head was spinning. I could barely manage to see for the tears that were blurring my vision, and all I could hear was the echo of the snapping sound and my mother's sobs. You will pay for this, I said. Firing off another shot from the gun, Christopher dodged it with a casual drop of his shoulder and strode towards me. I pulled out another stake and went to reload for a second time, but my hands were clumsy, shaking so badly it was like I was human again. Come on, Merriwin. Don't make this any more painful than it needs to be. Actually, though, it should be quite interesting. I wonder if it's as painful when you die a second time as it was the first. You will let me know, won't you? Though I should be able to tell by how much you scream. As he stepped closer, I stumbled backwards. I wasn't sure how many stakes I had left in my pocket, but I knew there couldn't be many. I took aim again. This time it hit him in the shoulder and he winced. You don't really think those will work, do you? At least not the way you're firing them. Maybe not, I said, as he watched me reloading yet again. But that might. Fixated on me and the gun, 
Christopher hadn't heard Glenn creeping up behind him, armed with a vicious pike. He plunged it into Christopher's back so hard it burst out through his chest. The gasp that flew from his lungs was as much from surprise as the blow itself. My eyes bulged as Christopher staggered forward. But if what Dad had said earlier was true, the damage to the heart probably wouldn't be enough to kill him if he escaped and had time to heal. He seemed to know this too. Christopher grinned and looked towards the door. He was going to run into the night and disappear and we would be haunted for the rest of our lives, mine eternally, if I didn't manage to stop him. Not trusting my aim any more, I tossed the gun and ran to block his escape. He came to a stop less than a foot in front of me. You're not leaving here alive, I said. You're making a huge mistake, he hissed. This isn't how we're meant to live, like some kind of pet not allowed to hunt. We're supposed to be great, Merwin. We're supposed to be superior. No, you're supposed to die for good. Then we'll die together. He reached out and grabbed me. I tried to push back, but he was still too strong. I could feel him pulling me towards him with some sort of sick final embrace. The point of the pike was now only inches from my chest. He was going to impale me on it. Goodbye, Meru. His farewell was cut short as his head snapped to the side. As it did so, it revealed one of the stakes embedded deep in his temple. I glanced to the left and saw Glenn frozen to the spot, the gun outstretched in his hand. Christopher's grip on me loosened and I watched as his eyes rolled back before he fell awkwardly to the floor, the pike still skewering his torso. Blog post 42. Date, July the 24th. Followers, 35,975. So, Glenn achieved what I couldn't. He protected me, and he made sure we didn't lose any more of the family that night. Glenn is the one who saved us all. Both of us were staring at the dead vampire. Neither of us could move. Neither of us could do anything. Is he... Glenn said eventually. I stared at Christopher, the same thought running through my mind. How could you tell if you'd killed someone who was technically already dead? I had no idea, but I wasn't going to take any chances. I crouched down to pick up a sword, but it turned out I wasn't the only one to have that idea. The swish of a blade slicing through the air and then through his neck separated his head from his body. Satisfied he was really dead, Mum tossed the ancient sword to the side. We should get going, she said, drawing herself up. We need to get out of here. All that noise. We're lucky the police haven't already turned up. What? I was glad to see that Glenn was looking at her with the exact same expression of bafflement I must have had on my face. Clearly, she was in shock. Mum, we have to stop here. We'll need to explain to the police what happened. It was her turn to look at me like I'd lost my mind. And tell me, what would you say to them, Merriwen? How would you account for this? There's one dead man on the floor over there with a broken neck and another who's been shot, impaled and decapitated, but who looks as if he's already been dead for over half a decade. How do we explain that? And we need to think about you. You can't get on their radar. You know you can't. She paused for a moment, but I'd stopped listening anyway. My gaze was fixed on Christopher, whose body, just as Mum had said, was gradually decaying. It wasn't like you see in the films, where they explode into a plume of dust. He just looked like he had been dead the right number of years. 
and trust me. That wasn't a pretty sight. What about Dad? Glenn said. We'll have to take him with us. A snapped neck is actually good. It means there isn't a load of blood for the police to find. The entire situation was insane. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Yet at the same time, I could. Mum was right. We daren't risk drawing attention to ourselves. To me. Glenn was shaking his head. From his pulse, it was clear the shock was just setting in. His breathing was so shallow, it wouldn't have surprised me if he'd passed out. Dad's dead, Mum, he wheezed. We need to go to the police. We need, and just like that, Mum raised her hand and pointed a needle directly at his neck. Glenn's eyes widened. You can't seriously be planning to drug me, he said. I will. Believe me, I don't want to, but I will. He looked at me, needing reassurance that he wasn't the only one thinking the entire situation was utterly insane. I think we should all calm down a bit, I said, stepping between them. Look, Mum... We need time. You need to step out of it, Merwin. We have no time. We have to focus here. Now tell me, can you hear anyone? Is there anyone outside? Security? Police? Anyone at all? I have never had such a problem homing in on sounds as I did that night. And when I assured her there was no one there, other than a couple of late-night drinkers passing by, I wasn't entirely certain I was correct. Okay. The car is parked just around the back. We need to get your father there and into the boot with no one seeing us. Can you do that, Merwin? I... I think so, yes. Glenn, you need to find where the recordings from the security cameras are and wipe everything. What? You heard me. We can't leave any evidence that we were here. Glenn scratched his head. Oh, it's probably stored on a cloud. Does that mean you could do it from home? I think. I don't know. That's not good enough. Can you do it there or not? Glenn nodded quickly. Yes. Yes, I can do it. OK, then. Let's get home. I might joke about how he's my big little brother. But at that moment, he looked like nothing more than a scared child. All I wanted to do was wrap my arms around him and hide him from this awful world he'd been dragged into. But that wasn't possible. The journey back home from Colchester, with Dad in the boot, was torture. His body thudded each time we hit a bump or a pothole and his head kept knocking against the back of my seat. I don't know if hell is a real place, but... That was the closest I've ever got to it. The moment she drew up outside the house and unbuckled her seatbelt, Mum was back in action. Glenn, the security cameras, deal with them straight away. It doesn't matter how much you have to wipe. Just make sure you've deleted everything showing Christopher and us. You understand? We'll start dealing with the rest. He nodded silently, having not said a single word since we got in the car. He got out and headed indoors. I suspect I was meant to follow, but I found myself unable to move. My eyes locked on Mum. How are you doing this? How are you not affected by what's happened? I said. Your son just killed a vampire. Your husband is dead and you're talking about covering it all up like this is normal. He's dead, Mum. Dad is dead. She shot me a dark look. You think I don't know that? I'm the one who kept that monster alive. I'm the one who didn't have the guts to kill it, as I should have done the moment I realised you turned him. I'm the one who has to live with this meadowin. All of it. But I'll do what I have to do. That's what I've always done. To keep you here. At that point, 
I realised I didn't even know the half of it. There are other vampires, I said, recalling what she'd said to Christopher before Glenn killed him. You've met others like me, and you've never told me. She confirmed it with only the smallest dip of her chin. We'll talk about it later, she said. Right now, you should get inside. Blog post 43. Date, July 27th. Followers, 37,721. Sorry about taking a few days to regroup after that last post, but I hope you understand why. It was tough to write. Much tougher than I'd expected. And I'm finding things so draining at the moment. With the rugby club donations, I've got enough blood to see me through for a little bit. Not to mention Glenn and Lavisa pitching in. But I've been out in the daylight much more lately, meaning I need more than usual, and it's a worry. I'm so fearful of what will happen if I don't manage to find a suitable alternative supply. If I had my messages and comments open, I'm sure more than one of you would have asked about Noah. I didn't get to the hospital for another couple of hours. Believe me, I wanted to. But I was dreading hearing that I'd lost him too. I knew I wouldn't be able to handle it. I'll get to him soon, I promise. But I'm not done with Mum and Glenn yet. <laughs> not even close. After Mum had snapped at me in the car, I carried Dad inside and propped him up in the armchair in his office. I don't know why I did that. I could have laid him on their bed or on a sofa. I nearly tripped over trying to get him in there with all the papers and books on the floor. But somehow it felt right. As I stared at him, I could almost imagine that he'd just drifted off to sleep while reading the same way he'd done a thousand times before. I was just about to leave when something glinted from the waste paper basket. As I moved towards it, I realised what it was. The heart infernal, I whispered. I reached in and plucked it out. As I clenched the red stone in my hand, tears burned my eyes and somewhere in the depth of me I wished that it would work. I wished that this single stone would burst into life and put an end to all my suffering. But the seconds ticked by and nothing happened. So I tucked it into my pocket and left the room. Upstairs I knocked on Glenn's door. When he didn't answer, I pushed it open anyway and stepped inside. How's it going? I asked, glancing at the lines of script on his computer screen. His eyes stayed fixed on what he was doing as he tapped away on the keyboard. I've found their server. It's just a case of getting in and deleting it all. I'll get rid of everything since the beginning of the week he said. That should arouse less suspicion. Don't you think? I guess, I replied. While he worked away, I stared at the back of his head. There were a thousand things I wanted to say to him. But in the end, all I managed was, I'm sorry. He paused for a split second, his hands hovering above the keys. Then the moment passed and he was back, typing away. Another few minutes passed before he spoke again. It's done. With the security footage sorted, there was no avoiding the inevitable. I needed to speak to Mum and find out just how much she'd been hiding from me. So leaving Glenn upstairs, I went down to the kitchen where she was fixing herself a large whisky. Judging from the smell of her breath, it wasn't her first, but I didn't say anything. I just stared at the broken kitchen table. When she drained the glass and reached again for the bottle, 
I knew she had no intention of being the first one to break the silence. You should have told me about Christopher, I said. She finished pouring her drink before she answered. What good would it have done? He was already dead, for all intents and purposes. And you were already distraught enough about having bitten him. If you'd have known the truth, you'd have never been able to forgive yourself. You wouldn't have had any chance of a normal life. I don't have a normal life now, Mum. I'm dead. I'm dead. And it turns out I'm a monster too. No, you're not. You're my baby. I'm the same as him, Mum. I'm just the same. She started shaking her head vigorously. He was never like you, Merwin. I could tell straight away. He was snarling and vicious and trying to bite me. You weren't like that when you first turned. You had your moments, I'll admit, but the real you was still inside there. No, she shook her head again. He was never going to be saved. I couldn't believe how calm she was, how matter-of-fact. But that's when I realised why. This was a relief to her. She'd spent the last five years harbouring this massive secret. Now she was free of it. But then I remembered something. What about the other vampires you know? Who are they? Why didn't you tell me? I was making it up. I don't know any others she said dismissively. The glass wobbled slightly in her hand as she spoke, though, and it was combined with an erratic heartbeat. I had no doubt at all. Stop lying, Mum. You deliberately sabotaged my chances of finding other people like me. You deliberately kept me isolated. She put down her glass and moved towards me, then attempted to hold my hands only for me to snatch them away. Disappointment flashed across her face. Darling, you have to understand, I did it for you. I didn't want them to corrupt you. I wanted you to have a normal life. I'm not fucking normal, mother. When are you going to see that? I'm a vampire. I was pacing now holding my hands against the sides of my head as I tried to think straight. At least tell me who they were. Where did you find them? When did you speak to them? This time, she didn't try to take my hands. Just lowered her gaze. I will tell you. I promise, she said. But we should probably get your brother. He needs to hear this too. You've been listening to Life Sucks, a Bloodsucker's blog, book one. Make sure you hit subscribe so you do not miss when the next post goes live. Bloodsucker's blog is written by Ella Stone, narrated by Hannah Lynn, and produced by Ella Stone.